Uh, before we start, uh, Dr. Montoya, could you explain what chronic fatigue syndrome is? Chronic fatigue syndrome, also known as myalgic encephalomyelitis or systemic exertion intolerance disease and perhaps few other names, is a chronic ailment that affects millions of people worldwide and has many uh, forms of presentation, but primarily devastates the lives of the individual, uh, the lives of the individuals who that affect. And it involves many symptoms, one of them being fatigue, but there are so many other symptoms, including sleep problems, uh, difficulties in cognition, uh, difficulties in maintaining posture or uh, dealing with changes in body positions, uh, temperature dysregulation, uh, the fact that they, if they overdo it, they crash. So it's a, it's a chronic complex illness that takes many flavors, different flavors, mm -hmm. but primarily can render the life of an individual uh, pretty much um, uh, to a stall, bring it to a stall. Recent radiological research uh, discovered that the brains of those suffering with chronic fatigue syndrome had diminished white matter and ab abnormalities in the right hemisphere of the brain. Do you think this is a step in the right direction towards getting a, a clear cut diagnosis tool? So I think that any well done research that, that is aimed at unveiling the biology the mechanism of the disease uh, is welcome. And we were fortunate at Stanford to have put together a multidisciplinary team that used a technology that had not been used before. And I think that that's one of the, I believe, key ingredients in, in unlocking the, the puzzle that is in this disease, the, 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 the the discovery, one of the key ingredients is using technology uh, properly chosen and carefully uh, thought about that, that has not been used before. So we were lucky that when we did this study with a new technology, with a new tool, we were able to determine that there were white matter sizes in patients compared to healthy controls that were smaller and also the right arcuate fasciculus in the patients was thicker um, than in the controls. And especially the right arcus fasciculus abnormality was something that had not been uh, reported before. And we were even more excited because we found that the thickness correlated with severity. The, the more severely affected the patients were, the thicker was this abnormality. Have you got any, any ideas to, to why you think that is? What causes it? So we are at the we are in the stage of of hypothesis uh, uh, driven uh, research. So one of the um, uh, possible explanations is that there is an inflammation that is ongoing either in the right erquet fasciculus per se, where the abnormality was found, and and that is part of why the fasciculus looks thicker on this. Uh, uh, tool. Uh, the other possibility is that is something happening in the other hemisphere, on the left hemisphere, uh, uh, primarily inflammation, and the, the thicker fasciculus on the right is in response to the inflammation in the left. Supporting inflammation in the left is the Japanese study by Nakatomi and Professor Watanabe's group. Uh, Professor Watanabe's group in Japan has a highly respectable group there. Uh, do a really good work, and, and they found inflammation in the left. And also we have electroencephalogram data suggesting that there are abnormalities in, 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 in uh, waves, in, in, in electrical signal mm -hmm. uh, from the brain in the left. So there is a possibility that this unilateralization, this unilateral changes on the right that we found could be due to something happening in the right side or in response to something happening in the left. 
Has there been much research done at your facility on uh, brain waves whilst asleep to, to try and find out what's actually causing the fatigue and you know, why people can't seem to recover when they sleep? We are not addressing the, the, the electrical waves or electrical signals through EEG while the patients are sleeping uh, only because primarily I think that's a fantastic avenue to, to follow. Is, is, is we are limited by two things. We, we don't have a sleep expert that in, in our group and, and, and certainly we can reach out to our sleep experts at Stanford that, that have a worldwide class uh, group. Uh, but second, it's way much more expensive because to have access to patients sleeping, you really have to have the proper environment, the secure environment. Um, and so it's something that is doable but it will clearly quadruple or quintuple the cost of what we are doing. Um, but it's something that it would be very interesting and, and proper to do. Yeah. There's, there's not a lot of money going into research for chronic fatigue syndrome as much as there is, say, upper arthritis or cancer. Is, is that something you're trying to combat your end? Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. There seems to be a lot more money being pumped into research for arthritis and cancer, yet there's not a lot of money getting put into research for chronic fatigue syndrome. So this is one of the more uh, challenge, the, 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 one of the more difficulties we have in chronic fatigue syndrome and is the availability of funds for research. Uh, the disease that you could have more parallel with is multiple sclerosis. And as an example, the United States National Institute of Health, the NIH in the US, uh, spends about um, easily $100 million in multiple sclerosis a year. Um, and this is a disease that is important to research and patients with multiple sclerosis deserve uh, not only great medical care, but also really good amounts of research. Yeah. Um, and it, it affects about 400,000 people in the US. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome from the same agency, NIH, gets about $5 million a year. Wow. Um, and CFS, as you know, affects in the US between 800,000 and, and 4 million people. And so there is a huge discrepancy between the challenge that this disease brings to patients to uh, medical care and to research because it, it, anyone who any any good doctor any good researcher who is faced with the disease per se who it, to whom is the disease is presented should be should be getting excited should be fascinated by by what the, the patients go through and should be fascinated by the challenge, by the scientific and medical challenge posed by these patients. So I think that not having enough funds have been one of the barriers for us to understand what the disease is. I think in longer term, do you think you'll ever find a cure? Oh my God, that's our goal. Yeah. And that's our dream. And I think that the, the, the race, the race is to get it done before we retire or before we die. Okay. So that's the dream, is to get a cure and, 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 and also that, that patients be, my, my dream is not, is, is beyond making the diagnosis objective and, and, and getting a, an effective treatment, but it's also involves with how to know that someone who has a really bad flu look like, like a very bad infection, how to know that that patient will go, could go on into chronic fatigue syndrome or not, and, and preventing that, stopping it right there. So, and so uh, essentially stopping it before it begins. Exactly, right, oh. exactly. Oh, that's much better than a cure. Right. Thank you for your time, Dr. Montoya. It's been a pleasure. Adam, great talking to you, well, well. and um, let me know what comes out of this, okay? Lovely, thank you. I wish you all the best. Thanks for keeping the time short. Same Lovely. to you. Bye. Thank you.